Um, I'll say good morning in a moment. I just need to instruct uh, somebody about the slides for a second, so please bear with me. Hello. Um, what I'll do is I'll just say slide, but what we need, I need to get the, uh, the thing underneath, so I guess escape. Um, okay, these are the slides. About halfway through, hmm. about halfway through, I'll say the the visor picture. Right? You switch to this, and then for the next slide, you go back to the sequence. Yeah. Right. But I'll, I'll, I'll uh, well, as I say, it's about halfway through, but it's it's not actually in the sequence. I couldn't get into the sequence, so um, you just have to switch into that, and then back to the. Okay. Okay, excuse me. Um, good morning. I'd like to thank uh, very much uh, Izmir Economics University, uh, in particular Dean Sepp of for inviting me here and for making this conference possible along clearly with the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung and um, the organizers who have put it together, uh, my teaching colleague, uh, Professor uh, Pantalis Vatiokit, uh, no, I'm having the same problem, um, Vatiokit, well him. Um, <laughs> I can say it normally, it uh, somehow, uh, anyway. Um, and also thanks to uh, the students in our class who are helping with the logistics of these two days. So uh, to all of them and to you, uh, my thanks. I begin from the conviction that other worlds are possible. Slide, please. I don't mean that there's human life in other galaxies. I'm just making a small but important change in the saying popular in the global social justice movement, another world is possible, so, which you recall was in defiance of British Premier Thatcher's ins and others' insistence that there is no alternative to the neoliberal order. My small change is of a single letter, from one world, as in another world is possible, to worlds in the plural. Other worlds are possible. I think Soviet history showed only too clearly the danger of assuming that in our very multiple planet, there is only one alternative to the structural priorities of capitalism. Today's jihadis, in a different mode, of course, provide us with the, the exact same lesson. The social tumult in many countries in the Arab region over the past two years, slide please, along with events in the Indignadas movement in Spain and the Occupy movements around the planet, uh, you need to go back to, please. Thank you. The Occupy movements around the planet have put this question very firmly back on the agenda. 
as did the 2009 post-election protests in Iran and ongoing protests in, in Greece. Indeed, the past 15 years, from Canadian protests against the multilateral agreement on investment in 1998 and the World Trade Organization protests in Seattle in 1990 1999, through the waves of protest against the US war against Iraq, and global social justice actions in Brazil and around the world, to upsurges in Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, China, France, India, Iceland, Palestine, and other places too numerous to mention. All these have put social change movements of different kinds on everyone's map, whether they wanted them there or not. For those of us who study media in their various formats, these years have been a particular challenge to what we do. Indeed, I would argue that for media sociologists, media political economists, media historians, these years have contributed to gradually reshaping the dominant research agenda away from a single-minded focus on stable, large-scale media and towards a, a focus on media and social change. This means then towards a focus on how mainstream media process economic crisis and its fallout and how they represent challenges to the status quo. But even more so, it means analyzing how our media, the media projects we generate within social movements, are operating within these tumultuous per periods and upsurges. I would argue that if practical solutions are to emerge to the planet's contemporary crises and dilemmas, ecological, gender-based, economic, cultural, military, grassroots media we can construct have a pivotal democratic role in developing debate and strategy and imagination towards specifying those solutions. And this gives media researchers a particular responsibility and mission at the present time, namely to use our skills and experience to dissect media uses and experiences within social movements. As we take stock of some of these cases and problems over these next two days, I hope it may be useful to begin our work by evaluating two attempts to interpret very recent examples of media use within social movements. The interpretations of the media of social movements that I will now summarize and evaluate are the 2012 studies by, slide please, Manuel Castells, Networks of Outrage and Hope, and Tweets on the Streets by Paolo Gerbardo. Of these two, Manuel Castells is certainly the more widely known, so let me start there. Castells. His book focuses upon three case studies. The Egyptian movement's media, the Indignados movement in Spain, and the Occupy movements, especially in New York City. His information runs through the very beginning of 2012. His media format focus is almost entirely on the internet, cell phones, and social media. He worked with a number of individuals directly involved with the movements in question or with access to them. Language-wise, though born in Catalonia, Spanish is his mother tongue, and he has been working in US universities for about 30 years. But for Arabic sources, he was dependent on others. Castells has been interested in internet uses and social movements for quite some time. One of his first books in 1975, in French, was about urban social movements. And his work has all developed out of urban social geography. He was invited to address the assembled indignados in Madrid's Puerta del Sol Square. He wrote this book extremely fast, in four months though useful chunks of its 200 pages are webography 
or bibliography. The speed of putting it together shows at points, not least when his visionary purple passages risk misting over his sharper empirical observations. If you know the expression, perhaps purple passages is used using the color purple to indicate language which is very uh, exciting and very dynamic and very emotive, but sometimes kind of loses contact with reality. Castells is, of course, very well known for his studies of the internet, and especially for the claim, slide please, that our contemporary planet is dominated by what he has long called the space of flows, by which he means that today, information flows via the internet are globally fundamental to the processes of human society. He also claims that there are certain crucial metropolitan cities which act as hubs or nodes of information production. New York, London, Beijing, Shanghai, Tokyo, Paris, Los Angeles, Mumbai, Sao Paulo would be leading examples. So place in his argument does not become insignificant within his space of flows. Slide please. Obviously, he is extending the sense of space beyond its conventional meanings. The arena of flows, or the zone of flows, might have been clearer ways to say what he wanted. All the same, the notion of frontier-free networks and flows as the foundation of contemporary global society is, so to speak, his scholar's brand identity. Slide, please. It comes as something of a surprise, then, to find the tremendous, slide, please. Um, thank you. Uh, 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 no, back. Uh, that one, thank you. It comes as something of surprise, then, to find the tremendous importance he gives to place in this study. He says unequivocally, slide please, the fundamental social form of the movement was the occupation of public space. All the other processes of network formation were ways to converge on the liberation of a given territory that escaped the authority of the state and experimented with forms of self-management and solidarity. Slide please. Later on in his concluding chapter, he claims that a hybrid of cyberspace and urban space, which he calls the space of autonomy, the hybrid is the space of autonomy, slide please, is the new spatial form of networked social movements. Probably, slide please, if he had simply written that this hybrid independent space is the new zone of contemporary social movements, his point would have been as clear or clearer. In the Italian social movements of the 70s and 80s, the term spazi aperti, open spaces, was widely used to develop the notion of liberated zones in the global South guerrilla wars of the period in order to signify the communicative spaces opened up by movement radio stations in Italy and beyond. Castell's more academic language has its roots in those times. His term space of autonomy, slide please, means something more than space of independence though, and would be better as a space where we organize the rules, not the power structure. Slide please. Castells also heavily stresses, as in the title of his book, Outrage and Hope, the crucial role of emotions in the process of movement development and its networked communications. And he further characterizes contemporary social movements as both global and local, as spreading virally, as self-reflective, as non-violent, and is rarely offering a political program. But the core term in his analysis of the Egyptian, Spanish, and Occupy movements continues to be network. Let's explore a little further how he uses it. 
For Castells, all of these three social movements were perfect examples of the power of networks in action, meaning in particular, though not solely, online networks. And I'll read a rather long quote here, which is not on the slide. The principle of having no leaders was present, he says, in the, in, in the experience of internet networks in which horizontality is the norm. I'll come back to that word. And there's little need for leadership because the coordination functions can be exercised by the network itself through interaction between its modes. The new subjectivity, he says, appeared in the network. The network became the subject. So horizontality and the network became the subject. We'll come back to these terms in a moment, but for now, let's hold them in mind. We move on to Paolo Gerbaudo. The next slide, please. Paolo Gerbaudo is considerably younger than Castells. Italian by birth and upbringing, he completed his doctoral degree on the media of the global social justice movement and now teaches in the Culture, Media and Creative Industries program at King's College London. He's worked also as a journalist on the Italian leftist daily Il Manifesto and as a sociology instructor at the American University of Cairo. His research for tweets in the streets took him to Cairo, Madrid and New York, the same free social movements as Castells. He has fluent English and Spanish, but like Castells, relied on Arab colleagues for Arabic sources. He describes himself as a left libertarian and an ongoing social movement activist. Mm -hmm. Gerbaudo's overwhelming focus, like Castell's, is on how these movements used Facebook and Twitter. Both of them actually also propose that in the USA, the Tumblr page, We Are the 99%, was a major force in helping generate and then expand the Occupy movement. And both of them play heavy attention to the roles of Tahrir, Puerta del Sol and Zuccotti as combined physical, deliberative, and symbolic places. <clears throat> However, Gerbaudo is highly critical of Castell's emphasis on horizontality, which the latter shares with a substantial number of activists and also with Negri and Hart sports on the multitude which books have become, in my view, more than a little Quranic for the segment of move movement activists. Horizontal communication was a term originally used <coughs> excuse me, rather intensively some 40 years back in Latin American media activist circles. But then it was used to contrast horizontally communicating social movement media. For example, Bolivia's famous miners <coughs> radio stations of that period. With the power structures, the vertical communication, top to bottom. Slide, please. Horizontality is a term used <coughs> by many contemporary activists to indicate the rejection of political leadership, not simply of established political leaders and parties, but the very principle of having leaders. <coughs> but this also overflows onto movements, internet uses. In its reincarnation now, horizontality broadly refers <clears throat> to what Hart and Negri describe as the swarm and followers of Deleuze and Gattari as 
the rhizome. Could we have the rhizome picture, please? If you're wondering what <coughs> a rhizome is, here is a picture of one. <coughs> Could you push the um, picture? Thank you. A rhizome <coughs> is a particular kind of root. As you can see, what distinguishes it from a tree root is that it moves sideways and that it's all underground. You see no rhizome root on the top. And so this acts as a metaphor for many movement activists for networked, <coughs> excuse me, networked social media. For Castells and for contemporary movement horizontalists, the internet is a technology which enables, profoundly expresses, and virtually generates horizontal political organization and communication. Organization and communication become almost fused together. <coughs> As Castells might put it, given his virtual obsession with the term network, the network becomes the subject, or the fundamental movement, actor, or agency. <coughs> <coughs> so the protest movement subject ceases any longer to be a clique, even a freely elected clique. Slide, please. From careful observation and comparison of Twitter and Facebook uses in these three movements, Gerobaldo comes to distinctly different conclusions to the horizontal vision. For example, slide please, he finds <coughs> that Twitter was used by just 0.15% of Egyptians during 2011 for any purposes at all. Only 4% used Facebook. In the build-up to Occupy, and for its entire first week, <coughs> Facebook was hardly used at all. He finds that both Facebook and Twitter were heavily used in Spain. Twitter, during the New York police attack on Zuccotti Park, on November 15, 2011, was very intensively deployed in order to help activists regroup and remobilize once forced out of their space. Castell cites a daily Occupy Twitter use in November of 100,000 a day, but on that day, 500,000. But on the issue of political leadership, and the absence of hierarchy in these movements and in their media uses, Gerbaldo flatly proposes, in opposition to Castells, Negri and Hart, and many current activists, that, slide please, <coughs> the ideology of horizontalism is betraying activists by being incapable of capturing empirically the gist of the actual practices taking place on the ground. <laughs> Slide, please. In support of his contention, Gerbaldo instances the crucial role of a small union office space available to develop strategy within the Occupy movement in Zuccotti. The pivotal roles of certain key Egyptian Facebook contributors at certain points in the Egyptian process the massive use of Twitter by a few activists to reassemble Zuccotti protesters when the police forced them out of the square. The decisive role of Madrid's squatter activists, the Ocupa, in setting up the tent occupation of Puerto del Sol after the initial demonstration had largely dispersed. Moving broadly in the same zone as Castell's space of autonomy, the hybrid of public square, 
and cyberspace. Gerbaudo, slide please, proposes the term the choreography of assembly to understand the crucial role of certain organizing elements <clears throat> within these three movements, space of autonomy. In all cases, he says, social media were crucially used for constructing a choreography of assembly, facilitating the gathering of participants in public space and generating an emotional tension towards participation. By choreography, Gerbaudo means much more than organizing the logistics of occupying a square, though that's part of the process too. He means the intensification of emotion, the escalation <coughs> of collective consciousness of being the people locked in conflict with an oppressive power structure, the growing embodiment of deliberative democracy in the public square, the networked communication of police violence when they cleared the square, or tried to. For Gerbaudo, in all three movements, this choreography of assembly proved itself to be an indispensable vector in the field of forces. <coughs> Pure horizontality was not, in fact, the sole reality. However, he never claims either that only social media served as protest choreographers, an important issue, we'll come back to it. Summing up Gerbaudo's co contribution, it's important to include it briefly some further key points in his portrayal of these movements and their media uses. One is his stress on the importance of notions of the people, a non-ideological togetherness of Spain's left and right, of Egypt's Muslims and Copts, of the USA's 99%, <coughs> in serving as a deeply felt collective identity for these movements, which is constantly reinforced and refreshed in their various communications, face-to-face -face or online or in other ways. He draws heavily on studies of populism by the Argentinian sociologist Ernesto Laclau, where the broadly leftist populism in Argentina has long been an integral element in the political culture. But connected to the vagueness of populism is Gerbaudo's notion of liquid organizing, the refusal of rigid structure, the attachment to the temporary autonomous zone of the public square. Castells equally writes of the timeless time of the public squares in these movements. Both stress the extraordinary intensity of ongoing face-to-face -face interactions in the squares, comparable to participants' reports of May 1968 in central Paris. But <clears throat> this escape from conventional structures, from what Gramsci called normal times, this secular retreat not into a religious center for a weekend, but into white hot political engagement and visionary exchange in a reclaimed and repurposed public square has an inevitable end, <coughs> brought about by gradual exhaustion and the state's violence. This is a reality plainly acknowledged by Gerbaudo, perhaps a little less plainly by Castells. Let me then express my view. Such mobilizations and the media formats that today help them navigate and take shape <coughs> represent high watermarks in the ongoing development of struggles against injustice and in the formation of a generational political consciousness. But their contribution to hammering out the specifics of new economic policies, fresh approaches, to the ever-growing globalization of capital. Practical steps, slide please, to end institutional sexism and racism. Meaningful engagement with the ecological crisis is one of frameworks and principles. It is for those involved to continue working, discussing, arguing, and in particular using social movement media 
to extend the information and debate process in order to make the possibility of, of other worlds a tangible, imaginable, grounded, but tasty prospect. Both Castells and Gerbaldo provide valuable insights into the processes of these three social movements and their media uses. They both acknowledge, of course, that these movements had historical roots in prior oppression and resistance. They yield no ground to, te to the techno-freak pundits who claimed social media platforms had sparked instantaneous upsurges. They both rightly emphasize the importance of place and of emotion in these processes, though Gerbaldo, not having Castell's network's book at the time he was writing his own, accuses Castells of not acknowledging either emotion or place. But neither of these authors addresses four key questions which I consider central to a full analysis. One is the one I just raised, the <coughs> what to do once the square has been returned to the power structure's purposes question. What media and organizational strategies and practices need to be developed for the period of apparent quiescence that follows overdue tumult. I say apparent quiescence because, of course, all the injustices that rained on people's heads beforehand continue to do so, sometimes with extra vigor after the upsurge. And there are three more questions, though. The second, or the, the first of the three, is a comparison and contrast, but not between these three movements, <coughs> climactic and almost simultaneously, simultaneous periods of upsurge, but between media uses in other movements with very different outcomes to date. The study of these three, compared and contrasted, is very productive, but you can't draw conclusions for the, for the whole planet, of course, from those three. So I'm thinking of Syria and Libya, but also Tunisia and Burma. The key question, again, is the actual and potential roles of social movement media over the long haul, after and indeed before an upsurge. And that now is equally true for the USA Spain and Egypt. A social movement has to be more than a protest peak or it will never generate a protest peak. <coughs> a third is the roles of media other than Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr within social movements. Both Castells and Gerbaldo perform a useful task, I think, in zeroing in on these two currently rather new media form formats to try to establish their particular roles in different settings. Jeff Baldo does a better job, I think, of differentiating their uses among the three social movements. He has interesting observations regarding Occupy on the importance of the Facebook platform in the USA as a non-political arena to draw in concerned citizens without prior activist involvement. <coughs> and on the importance of sustaining moment-by-moment moment Facebook interaction. But both writers virtually fail by holding rather strictly to this new, new thing focus to address either the roles of other media formats in these social movements or, of course, their mutual interactions. There are exceptions. Castells has an interesting paragraph popped in at the very end <coughs> of his section on Egypt, which summarizes a list of other media formats utilized in Syria's anti-Assad movement. At another point, he touches on the importance of pre-existing offline social networks in enabling pamphlets to circulate in Cairo's slums though the formulation, the terminology of pre-existing offline networks seems almost like an authentic netizen's nod to being inclusive. 
uh, those networks are much more fundamental, I would argue. <coughs> Joe Baldor is, if anything, stricter than Castells in his social media focus, though he does acknowledge the importance of Al Jazeera in sustaining the Egyptian movement. But it's a gap in their work which needs filling. I hope you'll excuse my noting the tremendous variety of media formats and their uses, and the great variety of social movements, which are to be found in the encyclopedia of social movement media I edited for years back. My purpose in mentioning them here, and the book here, is that those 250 entries are merely the tip of the iceberg of social movement media experience around the planet. Dina Lankush, in her initial presentation, introduced us to just three more. The media research community at large, then, cannot fixate solely on the internet and social media or on contemporary social movements, any more than it should fixate upon video or fixate on popular music or fixate on street theater or fixate on community radio, or fixate on posters. It is the ensemble of these formats which collectively media researchers need to address. The landmark study by Annabelle Sfabeni and Ali Mohammadi <coughs> of Iran's movement media against the Shah of Iran in the 1970s, Small Media Big Revolution, illustrates in its breadth of media formats analyzed the research model to follow. And finally, there's no doubt that Castells, slide please, and Gerbaudo are fully aware of repressive internet uses, from surveillance to mobile phone zone close downs to regime blogs. They're too, but nonetheless, their two studies are virtually silent on the subject. And one has to ask. What is the democratic network subjectivity of and in and among Langley, the Central Intelligence Agency, Fort Meade, the National Security Agency, and the Pentagon? I mean, is that also horizontal and democratic because it's electronically networked? It's not a question of citing these internet and mobile phone repressive dimensions in order to generates the higher fatalism of some political Cassandras who simply revel <coughs> in listing every obstacle to social justice in loving detail. But a degree of balance on the topic is essential for this research and for social change. Thank you very much. Yes, how, how, long, how long do we have? We have about you know, 10, 15 minutes for the questions. Okay, and then fine. We can <coughs> You're on time, actually, but we can still Yeah, sure. No. Well, the, there's other panels to come, yes. so. If any questions? All objections are also <laughs> welcome. Please. I have a question. Uh, this may sound like constraint of our student ask you. Um, like all these protests that have like got in Egypt and other um, Arabic countries, um, is there slight is there slight chance that they there's like a hand of like an intelligence service of certain countries mm -hmm. that you know that they, <coughs> they kind of assisted the activists mm -hmm. and therefore you know they guided the publics and then eventually it led up to. Um, you know, those street protests? Mm -hmm. Or do you think they are um, entirely independent? What would you say on that? Um, my own view is that they are fundamentally independent, but I also think that, you know, going back quite a long way, going back to the 1980s, um, the Solidarity Movement, uh, capital S Solidarity is the name it gave itself, in Poland against the Soviet-backed uh, dictatorship. Um, uh, there's no question but that the United States uh, at a certain point began to supply the activists in solidarity with uh, funds and with um, 
uh, photocopy machines and, and a variety of, of things like that. Um, so that, um, and in Serbia, in the movement against Milosevic, um, there's no question that many Serbs were terminally disgusted with Milosevic. But at the same time, at a certain point, there's no question but that the United States uh, put in some help <coughs> to some of the activists uh, in Serbia. And um, given some of the speeches by former Secretary of State Clinton about internet usage and freedom and the United States' uh, historic mission to uh, support uh, all this around the world, um, uh, that uh, I have, in a sense, I, I mean, I don't know of the evidence, but I would not be surprised. I would be surprised not to find that the United States had, had supported in various ways certain elements within these movements. Um, so, but I think uh, uh, the choice clearly for movement activists is whether in a very tough situation uh, they choose to go it totally alone and avoid uh, supping with the devil, so to speak, with a long spoon, um, or whether uh, they actually take the help where they can and move on. After all, um, the Taliban, uh, before the uh, Soviets were forced out of Afghanistan, were also very materially helped, I mean, with large chunks of military hardware by the US. So, as I say, it would be surprising to me if this were not the case. But I don't think that is the creative force behind the movement. The creative force behind the movement <coughs> is the policies of the Mubarak regime, the policies of the Ben Ali regime, and so on. And that's where to look for the the, the fundamental cause. Please. Uh, while I was listening, uh, I remembered uh, an article by Clark Shorkey on uh, the foreign affairs in 2011. Right. Uh, it was about uh, social movements in the media. And there was an example here from uh, a guideline in Tahrir Square. It was written that never distribute this square in Twitter or Facebook. And while I was talking to a friend of mine uh, from Egypt, she told something uh, similar to this one. Uh, the thing which happened in Cairo did not occur when, uh, by the help of the Twitter or the Facebook. Mm -hmm. It happened when internet was broken mm -hmm. and when people went to the streets to see what was going on. Mm -hmm. uh, the, my question <coughs> here is, uh, are we uh, techno-determinist about these issues of social media? Because uh, all we see here are the examples of uh, post-socialist or post-Marxist movements or some of ethical movements. And they have a, a historical root. And they have a history in the street as well. But uh, I think there are some more uh, new media activisms. New media art is that, or uh, there are some petition campaigns which had achieved a great success. Are we concentrating on the right side of uh, new media movements, or uh, are we overestimating them? That's my question. Well, uh, in many senses, it's it's one of the points that I was trying to get across in, in my talk as well. That that. Uh, in my view, the, the pundits, the, what I sometimes call the commentocracy um, in the sort of major media, uh, has had a whole stupid field day uh, of a sort of a techno hysteria kind of field day, right, uh, about these things. At the same time, uh, that doesn't mean to say that these uh, applications of these technologies had no implications, had no involvement. So I think the, the question to do, and I think these two authors, despite uh, my criticisms of some aspects of their work, what they, to some degree, are trying to do is to locate and specify exactly what roles these played. And they played, as Jabaudo in particular argues, different roles at different times in each of the three different movements. And, you know, um, uh, Jabaudo suggests that, um, you know, there is Facebook, which is only used by 4% of Egyptians. On the other hand, <coughs> there are graffiti on the walls of Cairo, which specify Facebook written in English letters, not in Arabic script. Um, 
so there's a kind of connection. It's not that there's pure causation, causation but there's not total separation either. And one of the things he suggests is that, on the one hand, um, at one stage in the Egyptian movement, the Facebook activists played particularly the page we are all Khaled Said, that played a particularly uh, important role. But the sheer importance of that role was then picked up by the regime's propaganda machine and used, or they tried to use it against the movement by saying, well, these are just the Facebook people, right? This is not Egypt. Well, of course, they were wrong. <clears throat> but uh, there, there was an element of truth in what the propaganda machine said, right? Uh, yes, and second, please. Please. Actually, I'd like to ask your opinion about uh, online, free online file sharing. Uh, mm. I assume it's a kind of uh, social media activism <laughs> because they, uh, they call their, uh, that, that is based on sharing actually. And there are really uh, particular groups uh, gathering uh, on some uh, websites, on some fi online file sharing websites and they call their uh, act, acts as uh, civil disobedience, like as uh, we are, I assume you are all fami familiar with uh, the Pirate Bay case and the other cases. Uh, and I think those acts, uh, online file sharing, they, they really touch uh, economical system, because global- I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last two words. The they will touch, they will touch. They touch economic system of yeah. the global uh, film companies, <coughs> mm -hmm. like Hollywood uh, really uh, has a, a global war on uh, those online file sharing sites. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think they, they, they have some words, they say that they want to change the particular uh, intellectual property system. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and they are really affecting it because they share the films and the music and everything mm -hmm. online. They say that uh, artwork must not be uh, uh, something that we can buy with money and that mm -hmm. we, uh, <coughs> I don't know. Yes, I, 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 the, the I, I understand. The intellectual property system, the, you know, mm -hmm. it's uh, corporate, mm -hmm. global media corporations sure. and all the networks, they are against it. and. I think that's kind of a social movement, and what do you think about it? Yes, I, I think uh, I would agree. I think the, uh, there is a, a social movement uh, around the world. It doesn't necessarily look like the free social movements we've focused on this morning so far. Uh, but there is a social movement of a less dramatic kind around the world of people challenging restrictions on intellectual property um, online and through digital media. I think that movement's extremely important. And if one's thinking about the repressive uh, controls over internet freedom and communication and internet governance, then it's, it's a really uh, critically important movement. But it doesn't have the same, uh, what I call, visibility or kind of uh, the same sort of intense spark and emotionality among people because part of it inevitably becomes on the technical side. And for people who don't have at least uh, some of the technical side, and I have very little, I readily confess, for people who don't have at least some of the technical side, they can only follow the argument so far. So it's difficult for it to become uh, like lots of people in a square, right, around that issue. But there are people and they are interconnected and it is a movement and it is important, I agree. Yes, sir. Yeah, so um, I really appreciate your interpretation of the three movements in uh, Egypt, in Spain, and the uh, US. Uh, now, uh, two weeks ago, there were um, political ele elections in Italy. And uh, eventually, the first party, the most voted party in Italy, <coughs> was uh, actually not a party, a movement, mm -hmm. uh, which spread out from uh, a web blog. It was a comedian, Beppe Grillo, who mm -hmm. started his own movement, and after uh, four years, 
he, he could eventually reach the majority, the relative majority of the vote uh, of Italians. So um, this is changing all the rules in, within the Italian uh, political system. And uh, we are, I mean, I'm, I'm Italian, and really we have no idea what will be the next. Uh, I wanted to have your interpretation of, considering all the previous um, uh, example you brought, so uh, in Egypt, uh, Spain, and the US, what we can expect and how do you interpret this issue, I mean, this mm -hmm. phenomenon in Italy? Well, um, I'm not Italian and don't live there, though I was, as it happens before coming here, I was in Sicily for seven weeks, so I had a little chance to observe what was going on at least where I was. Um, so I speak cautiously uh, because my, my information is, is uh, patchy. Uh, but my sense is that if you look at, it's a very particular phenomenon, whether it's changing the rulers of game beyond Italy, I, 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 I kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm be very cautious about saying that. Within Italy, I think I relate it to the uh, long-term quiet crisis of democracy in Italy since, uh, let's say, 1922. Um, so after 22 years of Mussolini, there's then a brief period at the end of the war and the uh, beginning of the post-war uh, when it's uncertain what's going to happen. But then the Christian Democratic Party basically settles into position for 20 to 30 years, uh, is the, uh, voted over and over again, uh, the system becomes extremely rigid. It then appears to change at the beginning of the 90s with the uh, sort of ascendancy of a socialist prime minister who ends up 10 years later in Tunisia uh, in exile for his corruption and having collaborated uh, quite substantially with Berlusconi in Berlusconi's early days. So here is a situation uh, for Italians which is of decades long, uh, a decades long misery. And for me, who've been to Italy many times over the years and love the country, I always feel that it's an absolutely fantastic country. The history, the topography, most of the people, the food, uh, history, you know, archaeology, etc., etc. It just has a terrible governmental system. And this is something which Italians have suffered. I haven't. But Italians have suffered from for, I would say, about 90 years. And at that point, Something like the Beppe Grillo uh, Five Stars movement, uh, which avoids television, avoids all the normal trappings and practices of parliamentary democracy, and simply appeals to people right over the heads and will not play the game, may be the necessary kind of forced break in the normal, which is essential for any change to happen. But what change will happen out of it? And particularly what change when uh, the Five Stars movement refuses to offer a program um, is not clear. And that's my worry. Uh, one more question. Mm. Um, do you think that this kind of movement is going beyond uh, uh, the idea, beyond the paradigm of uh, uh, liquid democracy? Because uh, we saw that, so you say that uh, liquid democracy mm. is something which is clashing <coughs> with uh, leadership. Mm -hmm. In this case, we are in a bit uh, gray zone, in a kind of gray zone in which there is a, a strong leadership with liquid democracy. Mm -hmm. Is it possible? I think what may be happening in Italy is what I call a, a liquid period, a liquid political period at this point in time, which has been gathering steam in a sense for 90 years, but especially for the last four. Uh, but exactly how this liquidity, one of the things about liquidity is, unless you're an expert on um, water, water engineer, water engineer, or something. Uh, how liquidity will, as it were, issue? Uh, what it will break out of? What holes it may punch in a dam, or whatever? Uh, if I can extend the metaphor, uh, is very, very difficult to to foresee. So I see it as an important step for Italy, but I think it's still extremely unclear how it, how it all resolves itself, especially at a time of severe economic crisis for Italy. It's... Yeah, let's have a final question mm -hmm. for the uh, uh, For the sake of not falling behind our schedule, I'd like to then suggest that we follow up questions on the media perhaps. Sure. 
So internet does not only provide this space, a public space for left wing or revolutionary organizations, mm -hmm. but uh, at the same time it provides a space, a public space for racist or mm -hmm. fascist, even fascist organizations. Uh, and this is unfortunately more often in for the Turkish case. Mm -hmm. So I wonder your, uh, I really wonder yeah. your ideas about this. And well, Maybe this is this is the kind of this is I agree with you, and I, this is the kind of point where I regularly and routinely part complete company with Manuel Castells, who's a very nice man. He's done a lot of very interesting work. I have no antagonism against him as a, as a human, but uh, his celebration of network as something which kind of automatically sort of generates sort of political and social progress, um, I find just incredible. Um, and my example of, you know, does the Pentagon, does the CIA, does the National Security Agency, uh, do these agencies of the U.S. government operate democratically because they use the Internet? I mean, it, it's, it's absurd. And you're quite right. I mean, actually, in the United States, one of the earliest users of the Internet uh, to project its messages uh, was the Ku Klux Klan back in the late 1980s. So uh, yes, I mean, you're exactly right. And this kind of uh, techno-optimism without any kind of questions, unquestioning techno-optimism, I think is actually quite dangerous. Thank you very much, Professor Darwin, for this. Thank you.